teaching is that I have to move or I can't talk. So they're videotaping me and I'm just going to try to make it really hard for them by moving around. So the, what I'm going to talk about today is the most recent uh, work that I did with my graduate students. And Amanda Taylor, Julie Stein, and Stephanie Jolivet. Uh, Amanda just had a baby, or she would be up here talking to you because uh, she's got her PhD and she's taking over working in the San Juans uh, while I'm busy with the museum. But those pesky little babies keep coming, and so here I am again. And uh, you know where the San Juan Islands are. But I want to remind you that the international border is, not, um, is this artificial boundary that not only affects us who live here and have uh, roaming cell phone bills, but uh, it is a, a challenge for archaeologists as well. There are different uh, permitting traditions in the United States and in Canada. And for those of us who do archaeology, the Canadians have a very uh, wonderful tradition of investigating the Fraser River Valley and the Gulf Islands, but they never come down to the San Juans because of the international border, and we never go up there. So even though you would imagine, and it is true that the archaeology of these islands is the same, what I noticed when I came here as a brand new PhD was that the Canadians were doing a lot and nobody was looking at the San Juans because of that international border. So I started my uh, investigation. I want to give you a little history and I'm going to talk about the history of archaeology rather than the history of the Native Americans that were here because what this talk is about is actually giving you some insights into the methods of the discipline actually affect the, what we know about the past. The very first person to do an excavation in the San Juan Islands was a man named Arden King, so it was a King excavation, and he uh, worked on a Cattle Point. It wasn't actually Cattle Point, it was actually Amer what we now call American Camp. For those of you who know San Juan Island, it, it's actually called South Beach by the residents. So he did this excavation in 1946, which to me is unbelievable. He must have just gotten, I mean, the war was just over, and he was taking a group of UW students out in the San Juan Islands to excavate. And he excavated something that's called the very first site recorded in the San Juan Islands. And this refers to this number here. There is a tradition in archaeology of numbering sites, and it's a code, and I'm going to teach you the code. The Smithsonian was the first group of people who invented this code. Not very imaginative, but they lined up the 48 contiguous states in the lower 48 alphabetically and numbered them 1 through 48. So when you see 45, that means it's Washington. If you see a number there, all you have to do is alphabetize the lower 48 and you'll know what state it is. This here is an abbreviation for the county. San Juan is really easy, it's SJ. <coughs> but the state of Washington has way too many counties that start with KI, King County, Kittitas. Then there's Klickitat and, you know, there's just way too many Ks. So the state of Washington actually has an office. Many of you probably know about it. It's the um, State Office of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. And every state is required to have one. It's a law that was passed by Nixon. And the abbreviation for the State Office of Archaeology and Historic Preservation is a SHPO. So you will be sent to the SHPO's office if you have any question about any archaeological anything having to do with your property, your state tax dollars, my state tax dollars pay for us to have a SHPO that records officially not only the county but keeps a record of 
a continuous numerical record of the very first site that's recorded to, I believe in San Juan County, we're now into the 500s. So when I look at a number, I can tell what years it was recorded because the 20s were all done by this, by King's students in 46, the 100s were done in, by 48 and 49, 200s, that gets a little iffy, or into the 60s, and four and five hundreds within the last five years. So <clears throat> when you see a site number, you can tell certain things. This is called the site number. These are the years that King excavated, and he actually built the chronology uh, based on what he found in these steep bluffs here along American Camp. This, I think you might, this is what it looks like in 2008. Do you think we could turn those lights off, or do you need them for the... <clears throat> so in 2008, uh, South Beach looks like this, and in 1946, it looked like this, and there's not too much difference. So uh, 1950, another archeologist uh, from the Bay Area, King was from the University of uh, Berkeley, and Treganza was from San Francisco State, and they, he came up to English Camp, 45 SJ24, so it was recorded very early also, and he excavated a very big trench. We know very little about Treganza's excavations because he technically um, took all the notes back to San Francisco State, there is a museum there called Treganza Museum, and there is a woman who runs that museum who won't let anybody in the door. <laughs> you might imagine this. Just, she's there, and she has decided, is that a little easier to see? It's, okay, so we need that on. Okay, it's okay. You can see the slides pretty well, right? Okay. So um, Turganza's notes are in the Turganza Museum. We know this, I just know it. However, until she is removed from the door, I can't get in there. Now, I have talked to the head of the department, I've talked to the dean, they all agree that she has to go. They just can't figure out how to get her out. So, I'm just going to be patient and we may know more about what Ganza did at English camp. From these people uh, and a few others and a couple other excavations, these, there was a chronology built of the Native American people who lived in the San Juan Islands. And the chronology was informed by the Vancouver <coughs> Fraser River excavations. Between 9,000 years ago and 4,500 years ago, there is a time period that we call Cascade. Now, archeologists put things into phases, and this is really a very Western way of thinking. How many of you know if I said the Roman period? Okay, got it? You know, you study this in school, right? Okay, Byzantine. Medieval, Celtic, okay. Those are actually very similar to phases. They're periods of time when certain things happened and everybody looked alike, dressed alike, ate alike, lived in the same kinds of dwellings. So a phase is based on what these people found in those archeological sites. Notice that the phases have very round numbers. This one goes to 4,500, 4,500 to 2,500, 2,500 to 1,500, 1,500 to contact with Euro-Americans. Now, that should be a clue to you. Do you think these are based on any really hardy dating sample? No, they're estimates because they had no way to date these sites. So they came up with these phases, and the Cascade phase has Cascade points. Locarno Beach, Maine, and St. Mungo had the appearance of lots of bone tools 
and um, uh, malls and archaeologists are people, they call these nipple top malls. I know the UW students would now just be laughing, but you're much more mature than that, so there you go, thank you. Um, the Marpo phase um, sees the appearance of actually malls that have flat tops on them and a, a, a variety of different um, stone tools. And then the San Juan phase, you see fewer lithic artifacts, lithic meaning stone. Now, another little thing I'm gonna, you would call these arrowheads because you're a normal person, but archeologists don't because they probably weren't used on arrows. They're much more likely to have been attached to a handle and used as a knife or a spear. The one characteristic they have in common is they have a point. So guess what we call them? Points. I know, we're human too. So the funny thing, and I don't know if you'll think this is funny, but we keep calling these points, and if you do a Google search, you would, on the Burke Museum website, and you would use Arrowhead, right? So you would say, wow, they have none, they have zero. Because we don't call them arrowheads, we call them points. But because of Google, we're now going in and changing all of our points to slash arrowhead. Don't you think that's funny? I, I, I kind of think that's funny. So anyway, the raw material that people in the San Juans use is this uh, fine grain volcanic rock. It is found, uh, in all of the beaches, uh, stream beds. It was brought here by the glacier. It is very tough to work. It is fine grained like chert is fine grained, but chert is a glassy structure and very easy to break. This stuff is very hard to break. The people who made the stone tools of the San Juan Islands were the highest level craftsmen I can ever imagine. In fact, we can't even, we haven't found anybody who can replicate them yet. So, um, in 1984, I, uh, Stein, Julie Stein, started excavating at English Camp because I wanted answers to questions that Terganza couldn't get his notes, King, he didn't excavate using screens or the way we excavate now. And so I said the easiest thing to do would be just to do my own excavation at a place where they um, already, we already had a bunch of information. Earlier today, um, Jean and Natalie asked me, uh, why did I excavate at uh, English camp and American camp? And the, really the answer is that it's easier to get a permit from the federal government than it would be to get a permit from any of you that had an archaeological site on your property. So um, I was bringing 20 undergraduates and four or five graduate students and three, four professionals, and this horde of 30 people were coming for eight weeks. And I, how many of you, and I want to see a show of hands, would have allowed me to come for the 10 years with 30 people for the whole summer? <laughs> okay, one hand, all right. So um, I excavated um, this uh, part of the site, and I call this part Operation A. It's out in the parade grounds. You can see there's the flagpole. This is the uh, blockhouse. And it started, um, every year we would open the same hole. This was the end of the first year, then the second year, then the third year. We kept digging deeper and deeper and deeper until 1989, we hit the water table and had to stop. But overlapping, and about 1988, I was excavating the same site, English camp, but I was over in the trees. You can see the commissary there, and the block house is back over here, and in the trees there is something called the depression, and it's not a depression at all. <clears throat> These students are standing in the middle of what we call the depression, but they're actually at the same level as the rest of the landscape. What creates the illusion of a depression is there is a shell ridge 
around the outside. It's a horseshoe shaped ridge, two meters in height, so it's way up here. And all of that shell seemed to have been deposited by Native Americans. It was Treganza's opinion, as well as King, and as well as the other archaeologists that had worked in the area, that these things accumulate over time. So if you excavate the bottom, and here I did, that this material at the bottom would be the oldest and was probably um, 2,500 years old, that's what they thought. And so this would be 2,000, 1,500, 500, you know, and present at the top. So if they had the money for a radiocarbon date, they would take one sample down here, they would date it, and then they'd say it accumulated up to the present on the top. So I came from a different place. I am from the Midwest, and I'd done my dissertation in Kentucky um, near Mammoth Cave. And we radiocarbon dated everything from top to bottom. You didn't assume a rate of accumulation. And so I uh, was surprised, I wasn't surprised, but all of the radiocarbon dates that I did from this part of this site were very, very similar. So these are those radiocarbon dates. Each one of these numbers refers to a place in the site where I excavated. This stands for the present right here. This is the year 2000. Going back in time to AD, BC, Common Era, these are the radiocarbon dates that I obtained from charcoal samples from all these excavations uh, places. The right side of this indicates close to the surface, and the left side is deep. So close to the surface, deeper, 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 close to the surface, deep, deep, deep. So the thing that you see very quickly is that these dates, although this one is in stratigraphic expected order, all of these dates seem to cluster around 700 AD, about 1,000 or 1,500 years ago, there's one very old date here that somebody dropped some charcoal that was older, and one that's slightly more recent. But remember that radiocarbon dating is a sample probability statement. So you have to have lots of dates in order to know what is the real date. So then I said to myself, well, these things don't accumulate slowly. They're giant dumping events where people came and they lived for, I don't know whether it was 100 years or two, three, 400 years, but they just dumped two meters of shell in a huge shell ridge and lived there, and then they left and they went someplace else. So this was rather startling, and I gave this talk at a conference and all the Canadians were there and they didn't like that idea. So. Anyway, I said, well, let's, let's see if we can find this at other sites, because nobody's really questioned it before. So um, I was the curator of archaeology at the Burke Museum at th this time, and there were level bags. These are bags, bags like this, and they had charcoal in them from previously excavated sites. These were a handful of sites that in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, people had put in a little test trench. Nobody had, they'd collected a few artifacts, but nobody had ever dated them. And so I went through these bags and pulled out charcoal to see if I could calculate accumulation rates on previously excavated sites. And what we found out was that there wasn't enough charcoal. The bags didn't contain enough charcoal. Now, I'm going to digress and give you a little lesson about radiocarbon dating. Um, we use charcoal because the outer ring of a tree is alive, right? The inner rings of the tree are dead. Only the outer one is alive. So we need to find charcoal of a very short-lived tree or a branch with a very small circumference. Because if I cut down a dug fir or western red cedar that's this big, 
and I use fire to chop out a canoe or anything, I am creating charcoal that is alive at that time, and if the tree is 500 or 1,000 years old, the charcoal in the middle is 1,000 years old, right? You got that? Okay, this is how radiocarbon works. In the atmosphere, there are carbon atoms that are attached to carbon dioxide, and most of them are carbon-12, the atomic number of carbon, but occasionally they get bombarded by solar radiation, and there's an isotope created called carbon-14, and there's a certain ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14, and it's running around, it's always that ratio. We are collecting carbon-14 and carbon-12 right now, but the minute we die, the minute that tree layer dies, we stop, stop collecting the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14. Now, carbon-14, being an isotope, decays at a known rate. It has a half-life of 5,730. And that's very convenient for archaeology because that's a half-life that allows us to measure the last 70,000 years. And um, it works really well as long as you have a known ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14. It's really pretty simple. So you get a piece of charcoal, you give it to somebody who burns it, they count how many carbon-12 and how, how many carbon-14, they give you the ratio, they do the half-life, and then out the computer comes the date. And that's how old it is. So, this was working fine until, man, these dates weren't working anymore. And very, very famous and smart scientists, mostly at the University of Arizona, but some at the University of Washington, geoscientists, they figured out that the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14 has not been constant through time. And these brilliant people actually use tree rings from the present back 10,000 years they built a tree ring calendar of bristlecone pines that go from the present to the past. They took a, radio, a little tiny sample of every tree ring along the way, and they dated it. And instead of getting the age, because they knew the age, they knew the calendar year of that little tree ring, they told the, the age told them the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14. Oh, it's brilliant. So they built a correction curve and distributed for free a little program that you just stick your date in and it calculates where on the calibration curve and gives you a calibrated date and out the computer now comes a corrected date. Well, this is brilliant and it's all working fine, but you still need something that was alive on the planet because it assumes that the atmosphere of the globe is circulating probably every year, every two years. So the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14 is pretty much the same whether you're in China or the United States. And so you only need one calibration curve for the whole world. Now, the problem is that it's hard to find charcoal. And the thing that's really easy to find in the San Juans are shells. And shells are made of calcium carbonate, which have carbon atoms in them. We could date them. The problem is that they're not getting their carbon-12, carbon-14 ratio from the atmosphere. They're getting them from the seawater. <sighs> The seawater gets its carbon from the atmosphere at the interface of the atmosphere and the sea, but then it dives down and it can go down into the deep oceans and it can stay there for thousands or hundreds of years until finally the upwelling brings it up to a coast and that upwelling occurs at different places and different times and different, it's, ugh. So, if you're going to use a shell to give a date, you have to know the correction factor not only for different times in the past, but also for different geographical locations. 
So Friday Harbor Labs, uh, there was a shell that got the correction factor for today. And it was 400 years that we had to correct for, for the marine correction factor. And pretty soon, geoscientists realized that that wasn't going to work for ancient because these upwelling events, we now know, have shifted to the north and to the south with El Nino and El Nino. And, and we need to know um, how those shifted during time, during the past. And usually, archaeologists go to geoscientists and ask to borrow their techniques. But for the first time, the geoscientists were coming to archaeology to ask us for help because we have paired charcoal shell dates. Well, we have a piece of charcoal and a shell that are laying together in an archaeological site that's 2,500 years old, according to the charcoal. If we date the shell, we can assume that it was 2,500 years old, too. But that can tell us, well, what's the correction factor 2,500 years ago? 2,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. So this is the paper that calculated the marine reservoir correction factor for the San Juans. And I brought samples to this. John is a geochemist, and this is my graduate student who happens to have a degree in engineering and is very statistically savvy. We had paired dates of charcoal and shell, and we had clusters of probability. And you'll notice that um, this is um, from zero time, calibrated age. So this is today, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 15, 2,000, 25, 3,000. And this is, tells you your correction factor. And what we found out was that from zero to about six, uh, 650, you need to use a correction factor of 400. And then you go to zero, and then you go back to 400. But notice how many blanks there are between our samples, because we just didn't have enough paired dates. So since um, 2004, so the work was done in 2003, 2002, the last 10 years, I have been collecting paired dates. I mean, not dates, just charcoal and shell together. I am not going to do the work. Some young whippersnapper is going to do the work. But those paired samples are in the Burke Museum, and someone someday is going to find an answer and a use to them. That's the great thing about the Burke, is it's this reservoir of a place where anyone can go. Um, however, I now had a pretty good guess at what the reservoir correction factor was. So I could start my latest project. And I call it the dating project, but my two sons said that it sounds like I'm actually leaving their father and dating somebody. So it's still called the dating project, but it involves radiocarbon dates, not dating. So by eliminating the problem with charcoal, I can get a sample anywhere from any site in the San Juans as long as it has shell. Um, I am, have not yet defined the word shell midden. I'm assuming you know what that is, but uh, the word midden is from archaeologists. Actually, it was uh, borrowed from Danish archaeologists who in Danish were talking about kuchen moodens. Now, that is Danish with a Michigan accent. So is there a Dane here that could actually say that correctly? Anyway, kitchen midden. It's the material that accumulates around a kitchen. And for us, because we have garbage trucks that take our garbage away, I have people think about it's the stuff that accumulates behind the porch, in the garage, under the porch, the can of paint, the the piece of lumber. It's the stuff that accumulates, because you might use it later, but you're just fooling yourself because you'll never use it later. And if it has shell in it, it is a shell midden. 
There are middens in the southwest, in Pueblos have middens, the Romans had middens, the Egyptians have middens. So it's a term that's used by archeologists all over the world, but here, um, well, ever, all over the world, if it has shell in it, it's called a shell midden. So I could go to a shell midden. This is a shell midden eroding right off this tree, almost all gone, just a tiny little bit left, and I can clear off the bank and grab a sample. Very little disturbance, and um, I get a bag of, a bag of uh, shell midden. It may or may not have charcoal in it, but it certainly has a shell. So I started this dating project uh, from 2005 to 2010. And the way that I took the samples were, sometimes I took them from the wave cut bank. Other times I used this Dutch auger where you would essentially um, put it on the ground. It looks like that. And then you just kind of screw it into the ground and you pull it out and then you use a ruler and you measure how deep you went and you take your sample right out of there. And there may be a little bit of contamination, but not very much. So when you walk away from a site, you leave, you don't even leave this little hole because everything goes on this blue tarp. You pull the blue tarp over to the hole, pour everything back into the hole, take the grass and put it back and you almost don't know we are there. In other cases, here's um, Jim Sick. I don't know if you know him. He lives on John's Island. And he pushed us aside and said, I want to sample my own midden. So that's his arm going into the hole there. And this is where we're taking the sample out. Um, this is actually Haida Point right here on Orcas where we didn't want to disturb the whole bank, so we took a sample here and here and here, and then we took this dirt and threw it back up there and put some weeds in there. I'm, I'm sure it fell down later on, but no one, um, it didn't do too much more damage than a deer would do climbing down there. And we had samples from here and here and here, so stratigraphic profile samples. Uh, occasionally, the middens were on top of a wave cut bank, so we would lean, this is Amanda, and she's leaning over this bank, taking the sample. This is um, Jones Island, the state park, <coughs> and um, this is Lopez, Now I, I thought Amanda, we were going to lose Amanda, so I made Eric, another graduate student, hang under her uh, ankles, because she's... Uh, um, sampling the, this is the end of this site. It will, it, this is all that's left of the shell midden. And so she's grabbing one little last piece before it goes. Now, um, also on John's Island, there's an incredible amount of erosion. This is one of the larger sites that we uh, sampled and uh, took, cleared a profile off here and another profile off here and another one here. So we got three different geographical locations. <laughs> Uh, at every single place we went, we had to map the location. So rather than carrying a stadia rod around, we are a, a rod to put the GPS. She knows exactly how tall she is, so she puts it on her head. This is Emily, and she walks back and forth and puts it in a computer. This is, this is why I have graduate students. I don't know how to do all that stuff. But, um, they also, you'll notice that Stephanie here also has one on her head. So they all walk around with these things on their heads and they know how tall they are and then they can translate this. This was my job was to talk to the park service, the landowner, the, I was the one who gabbed. And uh, you'll notice Amanda has all the notes. This is on uh, Jones Island with the park service. They were incredible incredibly cooperative and really excited about us working um, on the island. So essentially, we took a lot of notes. This is what a bag looks like. This will go in the bag, and believe it or not, there's shell in there. And um, it would all go back to the Burke Museum. We, every single radiocarbon date costs $600, and we uh, dated um, 84 of them, 
It was about $50,000 for the radiocarbon dating. Um, graduate students don't work for free anymore because they have to eat and they have to pay lots of tuition dollars. So we had no money to feed ourselves or to transport ourselves anywhere. So we, if I would have met you then, I would have said, oh, do you have a boat? <laughs> would you take us to? So um, many people did. This is a great uh, couple from Shaw Island who took us uh, to lots of different places and we loved their boat because it was just so fun. I was telling people that I brought a canoe here. This is right here at Camp Orkila. We rented a canoe uh, north of the airport and canoed along this point. And the campers were all here, so we're dodging. We kind of don't want anyone to see us. We had permission, but we kind of went and pushed the canoe up and crawled up and took our bag and crawled back down and went the other way with the tide going the wrong way in a canoe. That was really stupid. But <laughs> this is as close as I was to Camp or Kyla until today, so I'm really excited about being here on the other side of the... Okay, so now this is our data. This is what we found. And um, I want to be... I want to show you, this is the sites that we did um, in 20, 2005, 2006, 2007, and 2008. And all of the black dots are sites that, we, that I dated using charcoal in using the samples, or I dated them at um, English camp in the excavations of Operation A or Operation D. So we had a combination, I can, we dated 81 dates, we submitted 84 dates from 41 sites as part of this project, red, blue, yellow, and purple. There were 146 previous dates from nine sites. Until this project, we had dated nine sites, that's all. That's all we knew about the age of occupation of, of the Native Americans in the San Juans. So with this study, we had a total of 230 dates uh, from 50 sites. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through and show you this in a time lapse, the oldest, the youngest. But before we do that, I wanna give you just a bit of insight into how hard this was to do. So there is on Shaw Island a man, um, uh, this 147, uh, no, it was 451, um, who said, I have a midden on my property. Can you come and look at it? And I said, I'd love to. And he said, well, what can you tell me about it? I said, well, if you give me a piece of charcoal, I can date it and tell you how old it is. And he said, well, I don't, that'd be nice. I'd like to know how old my site is, but how does it compare to how old other sites are? And I said, well, we've only dated nine other sites. And he went, that's crazy. How could that possibly be? So I said, well, I'd like to date lots of sites, but it's very hard to get the open, lovely people of the islands to embrace a stranger to come and take something from your private property. I mean, you're no different from anybody in Seattle. It would be just as bad. But so he said, well, I know some people. So he'd send an email to somebody, and they would, he would say, Julie's a good person. <laughs> and then I would write the person and say, I would like to come to your property and take a big freezer bag full of shellmen from, from your front door. And they'd say, well, why, when are you going to come? What are you going to do? How are you going to do that? I want to be there. I don't know. What are you... So then I would go to their property and I would say, I'm Julie and this is what I would do. And I would even demonstrate. But I couldn't take the sample because I didn't have a permit. So we would show, I would talk, we would say, and, and then I would say, I am going to write for a permit. You are going to get a very official looking letter from the state office, the SHPO, and they're going to say, Julie says she has permission from you, but I don't believe Julie. I have to hear from you directly. Please send this in. So I have to write a permit 
for every single property, for every single person, and submit it to the SHPO. Then the SHPO, we have a law here, every single permit has to be reviewed by the tribe. So then it goes to the Lummi and the Samish, and then I have to go to the Lummi and Samish and, com and explain to them what the project is. They advise the SHPO on whether the permit should be granted or not. In the meantime, they're sending you a letter and you have to write something and send it back to the SHPO who then tells me whether I got my permit or not. Then I come back to your property, and this has taken a year, by the way, the next year, and then I take the bag of dirt. In some cases, the landowner actually kept the bag of dirt from the previous year on their front porch for us instead of wasting any more midden. So, this tells you why in 2007 there's one dot and it was a site that wasn't previously recorded so we recorded it and but when you record a site you're allowed to take one bag of sample but in 2007 we were running all over these islands asking permission introducing ourselves saying we will be back and in 2008, look at how many purples there are. That's the work we did in 2007. So, oh man, this Waldron was just a kick. We did it in one day. We begged a ride. We, we sat at the post office until a guy, a man, was going to come and pick us up. Sure enough, a truck shows up. Are you the archaeologist? We drive through the woods and he drops us off over here and we walk around the island and then another person comes and picks us up because somebody told somebody that they had to come and pick up the archaeologists at 3 o'clock at this place. I love Waldron. I mean, I don't know how it worked, but it worked. Everywhere we went, there was a boat, you know, there was just a person. There was a, there were, you guys are just the best when you know somebody. Um, it was unbelievably fun, and we met so many, we met so many people, and we have the best data and the best samples. So now I'm going to tell you about those. Um, okay, so this is 500-year increments. BP stands for before present. So 4,000 years ago, one site. Mud Bay, Lopez Island, the site is 3,700 years ago. Oldest site in the San Juans. There were people all around here before that. Up in the Fraser and the, the peninsula, it's just we haven't found a site with a radiocarbon date any older than 35, 3,700 years old. The next 500 years, we now have two sites. But notice that the earliest sites are, way, are over here on the eastern, southeastern part of the islands. The next one's still on Lopez. And uh, actually, is that Decatur? Yeah. 2,500 to 2,000, we now have SJ-24, that's the English camp. Um, if there's a dot around it like that, that means it's um, a small site versus a large site. So forget the blot, it's, it's the color you should look at. So these are ones that were all dated long ago. Susha Island, that was from the collections found in the Burke Museum. These were all found in the Burke Museum. Uh, us were still found in the Burke Museum. No, actually, that's not true. These aren't color-coded. I, wait, I'm wrong. These aren't color-coded anymore. These are just sites, all the sites that are that age. So then we get into what would be called Marpole, and we're nothing on Orcas, and now we get onto Orcas. Um, downtown, East Town, uh, Haida Point, uh, over in Shaw, uh, still Susha Island, and sometimes we have multiple dates for these archaeological sites. Now we're distributed all through the San Juans. 
still quite a few in various places. Suddenly, between 1,000 and 500, we see a much denser pack of, of uh, dots. And 500 to zero is another ex extensively packed. So what we found, and this is, open your minds to this graph, what we found, if you line up the site numbers from SJ1 to 509, and you put zero age back to 4,000 years ago, we found that most of the radiocarbon dates, which are probability sa samples, so there's always an error, plus or minus, most of the radiocarbon ages fell between 700 and 300 years ago. Shocking. I mean, a shockingly large number. All of these sites, it got to the point where we'd take a site and we'd say, oh, yep, 650. Yep, 520. Yep. All the same. Occasionally, some of the older sites are out here. Why did this happen? So, we have four hypothesis of why this might be. First of all, we think it could be or might be climate change. A second one is that they invented a way to get more resources. No one knows when reef netting was invented, and it could have been invented around 700 or 600 years ago. Maybe they all just shifted for some reason instead of living all together on the mainland, they dispersed out into the islands, or perhaps they were out here before, but everything that's older than 700 years ago is being eroded much more quickly, and we have a smaller sample size. So I'm, only, I'm going to spend some time talking about this one because it's a really cool story. And it has to do with uh, Dana Lepofsky, who's a faculty member at um, Simon Fraser. And a group of, of uh, her colleagues in 2005 went through the radiocarbon uh, database of Canada and summed up probability to see when were most si people there, assuming that archaeologists have been excavating uh, similarly across the landscape and across the time periods. And they found a huge peak between 2,500 and about 1,200 years ago. 2,500 to 1,000 is good enough. And they, they say that it coincides with something that pollen studies have shown from cores taken from lakes that there was an increased amount of fires in this region, both here on the San Juans and in the Fraser and in the Gulf, and it's called the Fraser Valley Fire Period. And pollen, it's, it's repeated again and again, there were just massive po uh, fires in the area. Now, were people starting the fires? Maybe. But what is known from the pollen in those cores is that it's also much warmer during that time period. And so with increased temperatures and dryness comes increased forest fires. And the explanation here is that when it is so dry, the only place or the best place to get fresh water and a stable source of food is the Fraser River. I mean, it's huge. It doesn't matter if there's a fire or not. If you're close to the Fraser, you're safe. So notice that there's nobody out here on the San Juans, or very few people out in the San Juans. And once the climate gets a little cooler and a little wetter, everybody comes out to the San Juans. This is, the gray is our study, and the black is Dana Lepofsky's study. Hers goes like this. She sees a little bump in this period, but not as big as our bump. So the explanation is that Dana put the Gulf Islands and the 
Fraser River together in her sample size and mixed them. So I wrote, wrote to her and called her, she's a good friend, and I said, hey Dana, can you like separate out your Gulf Island from your Fraser River? Because I think what she would see is that the Gulf Islands are making this bump and the Fraser River is making this bump. And she said, well, I'm not gonna do it, Julie, but it's a good idea, you know, some student later on will do it, but I'm done with that study. So anyway, somebody will do it eventually, uh, and uh, I just think that it's an intriguing notion that although people were probably here and around, they didn't live here because it was even drier and even hotter than it is now, and there were forest fires everywhere. That's one hypothesis. Um, notice that this is the Fraser River fire period, Fraser Valley fire period, and we have no signal of that on the San Juans. Another is the uh, invention of reef netting. Uh, how many of you have heard of reef netting and know how it works? Okay. So, there's a canoe on one side and a canoe on the other, and they stretch a row of net between, and there's anchors that are tying the canoe. They put the net down, somebody is looking, they say, you know, the, the fish are coming, you trick the fish into going into your net. They pull the net up into one uh, boat so that all the fish go into the other. You detach this canoe, it goes to shore with all the fish, another canoe comes out, attaches to the anchors, and you're ready to go again. The reef netting was so slick that there's a wonderful quote of the um, native peep fisherman would watch the uh, American uh, fishermen sneak out at dark to try to figure out how their lines were attached because they couldn't figure out, their, their reef nets, they couldn't get the reef netting thing to work on their boats and they never did really figure it out. So when did this start? Uh, we, if it was reef netting, we should find a greater number of salmon vertebrae, fish vertebrae, in sites that are more recent than sites that were less, I mean older. And uh, we did count them. Undergraduates love them, they'll do anything. And uh, there was not, no significant difference in the number of salmon vertebrae that we found in the samples that were older or younger. So we are, uh, Amanda for her dissertation did a very extensive erosion study about um, where the sites are found relative to fetch and whether uh, uh, topography and how close they were to streams and uh, none of it actually uh, statistically lined up. But anybody who lives in the islands can see these middens eroding. And the one that I showed you that Amanda was hanging off Lopez Island, it will be gone if it's not already gone. It'll be gone in, a, in another um, 10 years. So maybe it's these small little sites that we were, uh, we were sampling that are uh, gone because they're too precarious. And it's only the big sites that are tucked away that are being preserved. There's a, this is a picture of American Camp South Beach. And it was taken on a Thanksgiving uh, storm of 2011. And I did not take this picture. I don't know why the National Park Service, Mike Vorey was out there taking this picture, but he was. And this is the place where you always see the logs piled up. The shoreline is usually out here, and this is an archaeological site all along here, but it's significantly above the wave crashing zone that it hasn't been eroded away, and it's that Arden King SJ number one site. So maybe that's the reason that, um, I, I actually think erosion is really important in uh, this story. Uh, so. That is my sunset with an orca whale. Not a very good sunset, but a, a cute little orca whale. So um, with that, I am done telling you about this project and what we now know about how and where Native Americans uh, 
where and for how long Native Americans have been living in the San Juan Islands. I will answer questions about anything, because I know you may want to know something that I didn't talk about. Five hundred years ago, uh, or seventy thousand years ago. No. <laughs> well, there's a volcano. By the, 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 the Christian counting. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> A.D. A.D. Yes, there is a medieval warming period, it's called. Um, I always get the date wrong, and I wrote it down. So uh, it is um, the medieval warm period is the Fraser Valley fire period. So that's not it. Um, it could be the, the Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein the year that Europe got no summer, and it was because of that volcanic eruption. And, um, no, no, that was Krakatoa. This is oh. Krakatoa's grandmother, which apparently was orders of magnitude larger than Krakatoa. It could be, uh, one of those uh, would last a couple years, maybe three or four. And what we're seeing is a radiocarbon range of uh, 650 to, I mean, 700 to 300. That's 400 years. That's, I think, too long for a volcanic eruption. For a volcanic eruption, but the European Dark Ages lasted that long. I mean, it's just yeah, it's an interesting uh, notion. I'm trying to think of how we would test that. We could look in those pollen records and see if there's any residual ash um, that came down here. Uh, I hadn't um, hooked that with this, but I, uh, it's a good idea. We should look at it. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> so from the shell, you, you, and you. Okay. shell mid analysis, is there a way to tease out uh, year-round settlement versus summer settlement? Did you hear that question? Can, I, can we know year-round settlement versus seasonal settlement, and uh, there, there have been lots of attempts to do that. Uh, you can look at a shell and um, assume that a shell grows, you guys would know more about this than I do, um, it starts growing its shell in the warmer spring and then it grows through the fall and then it stops in the winter. Is that roughly right? Well, the problem here in the Northwest is that if you have a little warm uh, an early uh, spring or a late spring or a warm spring and then it stops and you get a cold June, you can actually get two or three rings in a shell. So the shell ring data that have been attempted on Northwest Coast do not give you good seasonal information. So the season of year, uh, there's herringbone. Herring runs are certain season. Uh, doesn't, maybe they store them, they dry them, they bring them into the winter village. Uh, people have used uh, the presence or absence of uh, calves, baby deer, elk. Uh, once again, you can store the bones of something in your midden that you acquired at a different season of time. The presence or absence of berries, once again, you can dry them and you can eat them later. You can store them in the rafters, you can... So there is no reliable way yet determined 
to uh, know whether people were living around all along the year or whether all around year round or whether they were just living in a season. Now the tribes would tell you that you only live in a winter village in the winter, right? I mean, don't be, they would say, don't, you know, why would you live in a winter place in the summer? You go out in the summer and get your stuff and you come back. How far into the past that went, we don't know. But these living traditions are really strong and they last a really long time. So one would imagine that big sites in protected areas could be thought of as winter villages. Now Wayne Suttles, uh, in interviewing elders, um, none of them named winter villages in the San Juans. They said that they had abandoned all the winter villages and they had moved to the mainland after the arrival of the diseases from the, um, from the white people. Um, the weather, this was the settlement pat pattern question, about perhaps after the Fraser Valley uh, warming fire period, people moved their winter villages out to the San Juans. There was enough water, it was cool enough, and perhaps they brought reef nests with them, and there was a reason to stay out here. And up to that point, they came out here only seasonally. But we, you know, we can't, there's no indicator yet. I'm sorry, say again. Oh, yeah. Well, this is a great question because many, you know, there are shells everywhere. There's shells in the glacial stuff that is the, making the cliffs. So a midden has um, shells in it, and it has uh, a combination of shellfish that are unexpected, uh, and uh, perhaps some sea urchins and some barnacles and some butter clams and mussels and all kinds of things. Plus, if you look, um, it's, the shell has degraded from into that aragonite, kind of chalky. It's, it's been decomposed. But the number one thing in shell middens are fire-cracked rock. And now you are going to be so smart because archaeologists look for fire-cracked rock. It is um, a rock that has been cracked in a fire. Huh? So, um, and if you're really cool, you call them FCR. <laughs> okay, so in the Northwest, they did not have pottery. So they um, made incredibly tight woven baskets and wooden bent wood boxes. And they would put liquid into these boxes and baskets, and rather than putting them on the fire, they would put them next to the fire, they would heat up a rock, they would take a piece of two pieces of wood and lash together, and they would pick them up, dip them in water to get the ash off, and put them in the box filled with liquid. Stone soup. And uh, when it lost its heat, you take it out, put it back in the fire, and you do it again. People have done all kinds of, um, you can do this. Do this in your home. It's, it's messy, but interesting. A lot of little rocks get a boil really rapidly. One big rock gets, you know, gets it boiling, but then it boils for a really long time because it keeps its heat. Um, you have a combination of them. It, you can get all the settings on your stove um, if you use a combination of rocks. You will find that certain rocks crack right away because they have too many natural fissures in them. Other rocks are really good. They don't crack for many, many times. Uh, however, eventually every rock cracks because the thermal stress of hot to cold to cold, hot to cold, hot to cold, they will crack. And when they crack, they usually have some kind of oxidation from the fire. They've cracked along natural boundaries. They look like fire cracked rock. I don't know how to say this any other way. They're round on the outside because they were from the beach, but then they're jagged where they cracked because of the fire. And so a shell midden has 
shell, a variety, a little bit of charcoal. It's got a lot of very dark soil, fine grain, sand, silt, and clay, and firecrack rock. Well, you look at any eroded anything around here. I mean, I hate to say this, but you know, downtown East Sound, the park, archaeological site. I mean, from one end to the other, there's shell midden. And I mean, we were sitting down there, we had a permit, we had a permit, and we we're taking our bag of dirt. And you guys are all having picnics all over the place. And we're just saying, wow, I just hope nobody asks us about this because you hate to point them out because people will then dig around. And they're eroding so fast that if somebody digs a little bit more, it's just they're going to be gone in a minute. So OK, there was somebody back there had another question. And I said I was going to go there, and then I'll come to you, and then you. OK, so the journals of Lewis and Clark, they talk a lot about trade routes between the Indians on either side of the continental divide. And I wonder if they refer to, is there any kind of information about trade routes of Indians that lived in the Trans Sea area, north and south, and when, and did they trade things? And well, the Wayne Suttles talks about them trading for goat wool from the high Cascades. So the upper Skagit would get the goat wool and they would trade it with the San Juans, uh, people from the San Juans. There's also t the, once they had reef netting, they could get salmon from the San Juan Islands. And we all know that salmon, the further out in the ocean you get a salmon, the more oil there's in the salmon because they're using up their oil as their fat as they go up the river. So a person that could get a salmon in the San Juans had really fatty salmon. But you can't dry fatty salmon as well as you can dry the Fraser River salmon that is gone, lost all its fat. So you want salmon that's really fatty in the spring when you're coming out of starvation, and you want really dry salmon in the uh, winter so that you can make soup out of it, and it'll dry really hard, and it won't d disintegrate, decay, spoil. So there's, ta there's quite a bit of evidence that even though they're both catching salmon, they're trading their salmon because they have different uses for them. And the shellfish are dried and smoked, and um, you dry a, a clam by putting it on a stick. And you put lots of them on a stick, and then you smoke it by the fire and dry it. And then when it comes off the stick, you thread it onto a long fiber, and you make a, a necklace. I mean, it's a big ring of dried clams. And they would take hundreds of these dried clam rings and trade them for wool or berries or huckleberries or anything. Up, especially in the southern Puget Sound, Salish Sea, um, they were trading for huckleberries with the, actually they were, trading, they were trading, the Puyallup traded clams with the Yakima for salmon. Even though they were getting salmon out of Puget Sound, they were too fatty to dry. So they'd meet on the high cascades, and they'd, in historic times, they would have horse competitions. And they would trade salmon for clams, and they'd all get huckleberries, and wives would go both ways, and um, it was a good time. On the <laughs> So we do find evidence of trade goods in the archaeological sites. We find points made of chert that had to have come from eastern Washington, because there is no chert over here. It's that black rock. And we find petrified wood, objects made out of petrified wood, and a very rarely obsidian, which came probably from Oregon. So. Uh, I said, you, then you. I just, you mentioned human remains in the midden. Human remains in the midden. So one of the reasons that I stopped excavating middens is there are human remains in the middens, especially the big middens. And the tribes have convinced me 
that we really don't need to disturb any more of their ancestors. Uh, enough is enough. And that's why I was always looking for different ways to get information without excavating a big site again. I said I would never excavate again. Now, the tribes believe very strongly that a human's body is put into the ground or a tree or wherever they're put, and they're meant to stay there and they're not supposed to be disturbed. And so it's, you know, it's, their, it's what they believe. It's kind of wrong to, to go against that. Um, so I just don't do that. All the human remains at the Burke Museum have been reburied. And that's 250 individuals and 20 or 30,000 objects. Kennewick Man is still there. So the phases? Well, you said there were several different cultures, so maybe they came from different, well, maybe some came south from islands to the north, or... Well, I, good point. I don't know where they came from. All I know is that they made things different from the people before them. Now, I tell students about cell phones. How many of you have recently seen a movie where somebody is holding a cell phone that's as big as a brick? <laughs> okay? So you, you look at that movie and you say, oh my God, that's a really old movie because why were they holding those cell phones? So the phases actually don't represent different people as much as they represent different technology. Now, sometimes technology is introduced by people, the migrations of people, the introductions of people, the clashes of people. But in other cases, they're innovation and uh, invention, and somebody figured out a better way to do it. So the phases only refer to the changes. And why they did those changes is a combination of they functioned better or they were stylistically cooler. So why did medieval people wear those tights and those weird clothes? That was the fashion, right? And why did the Romans wear what they wore? They weren't necessarily different people, they just had different fashions for the same function. So that's what I think the phases are. But your point is well taken in that it could be that people introduced innovations from other regions. But they would have been right around here. There's no evidence that they came from long ways away. Um, what do you know about cannabis bulbs and uh, this, uh, do you ever find old ones or re remnants of them or were they traded or were they eaten? And so cannabis is uh, very well studied in the eastern part of our state because um, there have been archaeological sites that were excavated that were nothing but camas ovens for as big as this building is. And uh, I, as part of this study, and I didn't have the two dots on there, we sampled the camas ovens at Camp Norwester. Have you seen those on John's Island? There are these depressions right out there by the, there's a totem pole, there's depressions, and then there's like, um, when the site was originally recorded in the 60s, there were 16 or 20 depressions. You this can't is see. The locus, the locus, yeah. No, um, Camp Norwester on John's okay. Island, the new one, not the old one. Okay. Sorry. Uh, and so we augured it, no shell in it whatsoever, lots of fire cracked rock, lots of charcoal, uh, and we actually. Uh, did charcoal dates there. And there's another one on southern San Juan Island by the point, um, it was private property and the people were 
falling into this hole for as long as they've had the property. And I said, you guys, that's a Camas oven. They're really? So anyway, we augured that. And uh, they were both less than 200 years old. Lots of radio. I think we did five radiocarbon dates on each one of those. That was really interesting. That's really recent. This is some of the most recent dates we got. I don't know what, I don't know. I have no idea what that means. So that's everything. I wrote a little paper about it, and that's everything I know about Camus and the San Juans. You mentioned Taylor's Mansion. Taylor's Mansion was how old? 9,200 years old skeleton from the tri-city town of Kennewick. There is a stone tool that is stylistically dated to Paleo-Indian Clovis in Whidbey Island. Don't have to go very far. They were here. And then, of course, I was going to wait till the end to bring it up, your bison, your buffalo, your bison antiquus, your ice age bison, bigger than your average everyday bison. Uh, it is definitely a bison antiquus. There's more than one individual. There were bison on this island, um, short-faced bears. There's also some bison on San Juan. And um, the one that you have here does seem to have cut marks. Um, if you, if I was a bison, there's cut marks where the, um, humerus and the tibia, and I mean the radius. radius and ulna. No, this is, yes. Yeah, anyway, you got it. So the tendons that keep this together have been cut in all, in three of the four limbs. There are no bones from the body and the head. So you have head and feet. And if you are um, moving fast and you don't want to carry extraneous weight, you will butcher an animal and leave those, an those parts behind. Because with all the meat is here and here and here. So you cut off as much weight as you can and you haul the thing away or butcher it further up because they were down in a bog and they think they might have thrown them into an icy bog and they froze. So um, there's a lot of people who don't know if those are cut marks and they're somewhat controversial, but more and more people are saying yes. They're, the bison and the radiocarbon dates are 12,000 years ago. And that's one of the problems. It's older by 500 years than any other date of any other Paleo-Indian, except the site all the way down at Chile, Monte Verde in South America, Chile. There's a 12,000-year-old date down there. So now people are hypothesizing that the very first wave of migration across from Asia is the hopping down the coast, uh, very close to the coast, stopping when they can, uh, and that they, didn't, they weren't successful. I mean, they lived as long as they could, and then they died out. And then another wave later, 500 years later, came and actually got a foothold and prospered. And then another one came, could have been 9,000, and another, and another, and another. So there was pretty much open migration after that. OK. I think we're, oh, yes. No, she has not. Um, you can radiocarbon date bone, 
but you know that our bone is mostly calcium phosphate with a little bit of collagen in between to hold the cells together. Collagen is organic. You could date that, but you can't date calcium phosphate because there's no carbon in it. So the question when you date bone is always, is there enough collagen? Uh, and she's so precious that we're not really willing to pull her apart. Some people think she's Marpole, which is 2,500 years ago. Susha Island woman is about this big, and she's made out of uh, elk horn, and it's, uh, she's, she looks like this. She's round in the back and curved on the front and carved into, she has hair and two eyes, nose and a mouth, and there's holes along her hair that one would imagine there was something attached to there. And then she has her hands like this, because when you say welcome, Native Americans welcome people on the shores, you could see your hands were out there. When a canoe is coming in, you, you say hello, I don't have a weapon, but you're also just showing somebody from far off in the canoe. Well, you can't do that with elk horn or bone because it would break off. So they always look like this. And she has a little skirt on. And she's uh, on display all the time in the lobby of the Burke Museum. So when you walk in, she's right on the left. You should come visit her. She'd love to see you. <laughs> Literally. She's the biggest. There's a Waldron man, and he's this big, and the school kids come.